Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Sorek and uh, Mati, our two players. As you can see, uh, Sorek plays the buzuki, which is a Greek instrument, especially for Hanukkah. And uh, we are here on, uh, on a Shalhevet uh, Fabrengen. We didn't meet here for a long time. And uh, thank God there are new, uh, new faces, uh, people who joined Shalhevet. So uh, welcome to everybody who joined. I hope you have a very meaningful learning together. And uh, thank you for joining, uh, for joining this event. I want to welcome and thank so much also uh, Mrs. Sherry Mandel who is going to give our the keynote. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, and uh, as usual, we start, uh, we start our, our, uh, our Fabrengans with a L'chaim. I hope everybody prepared their L'chaim with them. I have mine. Um, and we're starting with a L'chaim. We uh, usually ask people who feel comfortable to open their cameras so we could feel, even though we're far away, we're in a huge distance from each other that we're at least in virtually in one room. So anybody who feels comfortable to open their, uh, to open their camera, uh, we will appreciate it very much, at least for the L'chaim. Um, we will start with just uh, an opening from uh, Rabbi Michal Falk, the head of the Tekoa Yeshiva. And, um, and he will, he will, Welcome us to here, and then uh, and then we'll start off with the Fabrengen. So Rabbi Michal Falk, welcome. L'chaim, l'chaim everybody. L'chaim, l'chaim. L'chaim, l'chaim everybody. Happy Hanukkah. I apologize. Uh, my, I, I lost l'chaim, l'chaim. My voice isn't... Uh, the best today. Maybe the L'chaim uh, will help it out a little bit. Um, thank you, Natan. Thank you, all of you guys. It's great seeing uh, Sorek and Mati, our uh, students from the yeshiva from a couple years ago. L'chaim, everybody. Um, I, I wanted to share with you a very uh, interesting thought that's connected to Hanukkah, and I think it's... Uh, related to the theme of this evening. Um, and I want to compare the candles of Hanukkah to the candles of Shabbat. When we light candles on Shabbat, I think the very basic purpose of those candles on Shabbat are for our benefit of the light that we need during the darkness of the night. That means Shabbat night, when we join all of our family together for dinner, we're lighting those candles so that we can actually see one another and enjoy our Shabbat dinner together. That is the real purpose. That is the purpose that the Talmud brings. And until today, although we have electricity, we're still lighting those candles to have some additional light. As opposed to the Shabbat candles, and Hanukkah, there's a very interesting halachic rule. We are not allowed to use the candles of Hanukkah. Those candles are only to be lit and not anything else. That is one of the reasons we use a shamash, the extra candle that we are able to use, we light so that we don't by mistake use the other candles. So what is the purpose of those candles that we light on Hanukkah? If it's not for our benefit, why are we lighting them? So what I want to offer as a thought about the candles of Hanukkah is that as opposed to the candles of Shabbat, that over there the idea of the candles, they have a purpose, they're coming to do something. They're coming to bring, add us light. In Hanukkah, it's not about doing. It's about being. The fact that we have a Hanukkah candle, that candle in itself, when it's lit, that in itself is the purpose. The idea is of being, not of doing. If I want to talk about this in a personal level of as us Jews, 
what is the idea of the candles of Hanukkah relating to us as Jewish proud Jews? What we are expected, what we are able to take from that Hanukkah candle is that it's not only about us doing Jewish activities, it's about being Jews. It's about being proud Jews. I think in many ways, in our world, we're always busy doing, doing, doing. But I think the essence, where it all starts from, is about being, not doing. That means many of us have so many other titles to who they are and what they are. I have a doctorate. I could be a rabbi. I could be a husband. I could be a father. I could be a mother. I could be so many different things in my life. And each one of those titles has its importance. What is the first thing when I need to, what is that definition, that very basic definition that I go by? Who am I? What am I all about? Many people, it's about their career. Many other people, it's about their family. These things can be very important and very dignified and have a lot of implications to our personal lives and to the whole community's lives. And still, I think what Hanukkah wants to offer us is that first very, very basic, basic understanding of being, being proud Jews. It's those Jews who on Hanukkah took their Judaism, their pride as being Jews to the extreme. And they came and said, this is who I am. This is what it's all about. So I wanna do a l'chaim for just being proud Jews. I don't think it's a jest. I think it's a very big, big uh, uh, concept. I think that especially uh, after visiting America and uh, being around many communities in America from uh, the Shalhevet uh, crowd, I think that that ability to come out and say, First of all, who am I? I'm a proud Jew. With, with no, it, it's not about what am I doing about that? I mean, obviously there will be implications also in the doing, but it's first about being. And that is something that we can take for granted, especially today in our world. So l'chaim for all of us who are being and proud being Jews, l'chaim. L'chaim. L'chaim, L'chaim. Thank you, Sherry, oh, yeah. for joining us. This is a, a big honor. And I personally, I'm very excited. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Falk. I'm just reminding when we're saying, when we say L'chaim, uh, we open the mic, we say the L'chaim so we can share the L'chaim everybody together, and then we close the mic again. So everybody is invited to share the L'chaim. Uh, L'chaim. 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 L'chaim George, I miss you. L'chaim. It's it's, it's already L'chaim. a month. L'chaim. 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 Uh, so Michal started already, Rabbi Michal started already uh, talking about uh, the Jewish pride. And we asked uh, Sherry Mandel to uh, open actually the Fabrengen to give the keynote. Uh, Sherry Mandel is the mother of Kobe Mandel, who uh, was murdered in 2001 in Tekoa with his uh, friend Yosef Ishran. And both Sherry Mandel and her husband, Rabbi Seth Mandel, has found, uh, founded the Kobe Mandel Foundation that uh, uh, takes care of uh, families of, of, ter- of terrorist victims. And, uh, and they're doing many activities, camps, and other uh, activities that are uh, uh, aimed on at uh, taking care of them uh, mentally and spiritually. And um, thank you so much for 
for coming here today, Sherry, and uh, sharing, share a little bit of what you feel and what you think. Okay, thank you. I'm very happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm a little tired because we just had Camp Kobe today. It was a three-day program. And we run a program for bereaved children, not, not just from terror. Um, and I just want to say that our camp, you would be shocked because it's one of the happiest places in the world. But what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is the title, Proudly Jewish, Living Our Jewishness Wholeheartedly. And of course, you can hear that I'm American. I've, I've lived in Israel for 25 years, but um, I'm definitely American. And I think, I know for me, it was very hard to be proud of being Jewish. And I, I hope for you guys, it's a little different, but I know Hanukkah here, you know, Hanukkah is the main event here. It's like our little candles are, are all we have here. And even in the news, I was just reading like the economic newspaper and it talked about donuts and who, how many donuts are bought for Hanukkah. So the whole culture is aligned with being Jewish. But in America, I know, you know, even Hanukkah is really like the stepsister of Christmas and is also being co-opted by Christmas, which is like, you know, ironic because Hanukkah separate, um, celebrates the Jewish spirit, which is very hard to maintain, I think, in the face of Christianity in America. But that wasn't why I was not proudly Jewish, I don't think. I grew up in um, like the 60s and 70s, and I had no Jewish education. So it's interesting because Hanukkah is related to the word for Hinoch, for education. And I think it's very hard to be a proud Jew without the education and without knowing the Torah. So I really commend the Shell Hebit program. I think it is a fantastic program that you guys are learning with Israelis because I never would have done anything Jewish if I had never come to Israel. Like Israel for me was the place where I, I learned about being Jewish. I, I knew really very little about Judaism, even though I was born Jewish. Um, in fact, I, I came here for the first time in 1983. I was traveling. I had been in, I, I had an MA already and I had taught college, but I was living in Spain and I thought I would translate Spanish poetry. And living in Spain, I just never felt comfortable there. Maybe because they didn't eat breakfast and <laughs> like their whole eating routine, I couldn't get used to. And also people were not friendly to me, even though I was there for months. And then I came to Israel and this was 1983 and everywhere I went, people were so friendly and warm and kind. And they said to me, stay, you know, we want you to stay. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to stay in this country. I'm just traveling. You know, I was on my way to Australia. But <clears throat> I ended up staying and I ended up starting to learn. And I was on a program um, where we learned Torah. And I remember that it was Shof team and it was about putting judges in all your gates and I said to the teacher, well, that must relate also like to the eyes and the ears and the nose. And he said, wow, that's, that's like what Rashi says. That's what the commentators say. And I thought, whoa, I am in the right place. And once I started learning Torah, I felt like this was what I had been looking for. You know, something real and something really meaningful. And I ended up meeting my husband. And he, he's from America, you know, and he grew up also very secular, but he had also, he had studied in a yeshiva. So I went, I had worked on the dinner party project in LA, which was a feminist art project with Judy Chicago. I, I can't see your faces, so I have no idea if you know what I'm talking about, but this was like an art project that 
was a retelling of Bereshit, of Genesis, only on feminist terms, only with women. And it opened at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And that's where I had worked before starting this trip. Anyway, I ended up, I was getting married to my husband who was religious. Like I'd been in Israel for about 10 months. And I told my parents I was getting married in Israel and they were in shock. And my mother, my mother came for the wedding and I ran in the airport. It was the old airport where you could actually just run to greet the people. And I ran to her and um, I hugged her and I was so excited. And she looked at me and she said, you can still get out of this. <laughs> so she, that was her support for me being in Israel, marrying a Jewish man who was religious. It was like, no way, run away from this Sherry because I had a master's degree. I went to Cornell and she couldn't believe it that I was like gonna cover. I mean, at that point I didn't cover my hair but she just was not interested in it. And also when I came to Israel, like I didn't know the olive that. So we moved back to America but my background was totally secular. Although I lived in New York and everybody in my public school was Jewish. So probably some of you have had that experience, I would imagine. I only went out with non-Jewish guys. And I think that I just had, I don't know, I was just American. And Jewish guys just didn't interest me at that point. It was sorry for you Jewish guys there. Like now I <laughs> now I like Jewish guys. But then I don't know, maybe I was brainwashed or something. It just I had to come to Israel. So um all right, so this is a complicated story because when we, we moved to America, we were, my husband was a Hillel director at Penn State and the University of Maryland. And I was, I taught um, <clears throat> writing and freshman composition and business writing. And we were there for seven years and we had four kids. And then my husband said, we're going back to Israel. And I was like, no way. I do not want to go back. I felt like it's just, it was too hard for me to make the move with four kids. And also, you know, I'm American. I, I liked listening to the radio in English and I liked knowing the culture and just understanding everything. And we were in a Jewish community of Silver Spring or we were in state college for two years, which definitely was not a Jewish community. But, you know, America, you're all, a lot of you are in America. And I mean, I don't know about now, but then that was in like 1990. It was just a very comfortable place to be, America from 90 to 96. So we ended up coming back and um, my oldest was Kobe. He was in fourth grade when we made Aliyah. And then there was Daniel, who was in second grade, and Eliana in first grade, and Gavi, who was um, one year old. And some of you have met Gavi because Gavi works for Shell Habit. And also Gavi went to Yeshiva Tzitoa, and Gavi loved Rabbi Steinsoff. So we're very connected to this whole community. Um, you know, like we were, we made Aliyah in 96. And then we lived in Afrad for two years. Then we moved to Tekoa. And in 2001, was when Kobe was 13, he decided to cut school and go hiking in the wadi near our house. Because the canyon from our house, you can hike in that canyon from here to the Dead Sea. And it's just canyon from here to there. And, but before you get there, right in the canyon near our house, there are caves and there's actually the largest cave in the Middle East there. And it's all kinds of ruins and an ancient monastery called Hari Tun. So he and Yosef Ishran, they went down there hiking. And it was during the Intifada, and Kobe was 13, Yosef was 14, and they were beaten to death. And um, 
you know, I don't even like to talk about Kobe anymore because it's too hard for me. It's been 20 years. He would be almost 35 now. So kind of like, there's like before and after. And actually somebody told me that in Jewish mysticism, it is possible to die in this life and be reborn. And I, I think that's how I feel that everything I knew and was, was finished when Kobe was murdered. Um, but like we were, I think we recreated ourselves. You know, first of all, I couldn't have done it without my husband and my kids. But we started the foundation. But before that, we had community. And that's really what I want to talk about in terms of proudly Jewish and living our Jewishness wholeheartedly. Because there's the, the Jewish text, there's the Torah, and all the learning, which is you know, so rich and important, but there's the Jewish people. And what happened after Kobe was murdered was that we really became connected to our community and to the Jewish people. First of all, in Tekoa, we were a very small community then. We were 200 families and everybody was in our house constantly and everybody had something to give. Like there was somebody, she did my laundry. There were people who dealt with the reporters. There were people who babysat for us. Then there were people from a frat, from a neighboring community. They brought us food every Shabbos for, you know, like months. And <clears throat> so much giving and love and concern, and not just from Tekoa, but also from America. And, you know, Jews from around the world really supported us. And then once we started the foundation, which we did right away, because we felt like we wanted to keep Kobe's neshama alive. And we were able to do that with the support of the Jewish community. Now, I'm also a writer. Maybe you, if you haven't, would like you to read at least one of my books. My, some of my books are the, it's called The Blessing of a Broken Heart is my first book. It's being made into a play. It was made into a play, but it's going to be shown in Jerusalem in January. <clears throat> and then I have a book called um, Road to Resilience and Reaching for Comfort, and also children's books. But <clears throat> there's something called the family story. Because when I was researching for my book on resilience, I looked at studies on resilience. And one thing that helps resilience is the family story. There was somebody called Sarah Marshall. She lived in Philadelphia and she was a child psychologist. And she noticed that children who knew a lot about their past, about their background, like things like where their parents met or <clears throat> how, their how their great grandparents died or where their family was from, their great grandparents did for a living, or even their grandparents, that those kids seemed more resilient to her. And she, her, she was married to, she is married to Professor Marshall Duke. And he took this on as a research project. And they did a questionnaire called The Family Story. And they did research on kids, also research on kids post 9 11. See which kids were the most resilient. And those findings confirmed their study that children who knew about the parents' and grandparents' life history were the most resilient. When I read this, I thought, voila, that this is part of the explanation for Jewish resilience, because we are an incredibly resilient people, you know, and like my mother was not religious at all, but she used to say to me, the best, um, the, the best vengeance is a good life. Like we know how to bless life and to, to, tr to try to transform things into growth and into compassion. That's part of why we did Camp Kobe because 
we felt, well, first of all, Kobe was a kid. We wanted to do something he would like. But Kobe was killed in absolute cruelty. And we felt that we wanted to do something to transform that cruelty, kindness. So <clears throat> in terms of Jewish community, we have our communities, but we also have the community of the past, right? Like every Shabbos, we're connecting to the, the writings from the past and to a prayer book that was written thousands of years ago. We're, we're, we're connecting longitudinally, and is there a word, attitudinally? I don't remember. I've been out of America for too long. <laughs> like wide and long, we're connecting. So we're always connecting to the Jewish story. And that Jewish story, I think, keeps us strong. And also what um, Professor Duke found was that the kids who knew from their parents about the vicissitudes of life, that knew about the ups and downs, those were the kids who were most resilient. And you can see in the Torah that <clears throat> we, we're, we go through like the most anguished cycles of life. Like just now, what, what we read last week, Miketz, right? It was Miketz, right? It was only yesterday, but about the Yosef story, you know, and that he's left in the pit and then he rises to become the viceroy of Egypt. And now his brothers come to see him. It's like we share this family story. And, and I really feel like this family story is what keeps us vibrant and resilient. And the fact that you choose to connect, to be part of this family story, means that the connection is alive and growing. So, you know, I just want to say that we appreciate your participation, really in the Jewish story both because there's a Jewish story in Israel and a Jewish story in America. And hopefully they're, they're the same. They're, they're similar stories. But I mean, I think you should all make Aliyah, I have to say, if you can. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. This is the Jewish story happening here. It is. So if you can come here, you, you really should come if you can. Okay. So I just want to end by saying this, that Kobe you know, we brought him to America, to Israel when he was in fourth grade, and it was not easy. He was very smart in school, and he went to a little day school in Silver Spring with 15 kids, and they had Shabbat Little League, and, you know, everything was sort of, he was in a Jewish cocoon there, and then he came to Israel. He didn't speak the language at all. He, he played football, not soccer. Like, it was really hard for him. But in fact, like when we made Aliyah, that first month of August, I remember I saw him in the library by himself, you know, and I, I felt really guilty for bringing him because I knew in America he would be with his friends and here he was all alone, but he never complained. And he really loved being Jewish and he loved being Jewish in Israel. Although, you know, Cal Ripken, the baseball star was his hero. And he also, Kobe, put up cartoons from the New Yorker in his room. So he, he had both worlds. But when people, you know, say to me, what, like, what can we do in memory of Kobe? I, I sometimes say, you know, Kobe loved being Jewish. And if you can put being Jewish in the deep, in the center of your life and make it both, you know, a lot of doing and being, because I think in America, you really have to do in order to be Jewish. I, I think it's so easy. You know, the tide of assimilation is just so strong there. And it, it almost got me. And I have to say, it got the rest of my family and most of my, my husband's family. So anything you can do to, like, stand strong and just keep connecting to Israel like you are and the Torah and the Jewish story, that's, that's what Kobe would want. And, that's what I want to leave you with tonight. So thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. L'chaim. L'chaim. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you. Thank you. So, L'chaim. L'chaim. So, so um, Sherry opened up uh, this discussion about uh, 
about Jewish pride. And this is what we're going to uh, talk about uh, next half of this evening, which is the way that we connect to Jewish pride. How, how is it, how is it, uh, how do we feel our Jewishness? How do we uh, live our Jewishness? What does it mean to be proud in our Jewishness? So I invite everybody to uh, think of uh, where they find this part of, of uh, being uh, proudly Jewish. We will now hear another uh, nigun uh, from uh, Sorek and, Mat and Mati. Um, it's a nigun of the of Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. If anybody heard of him, he was considered one of the people who who were loving of Israel, of the people of Israel, and he always found a good point, a good uh, thing about the people of Israel. So this nigun is a nigun of uh, looking inside and thinking inside, and after that uh, we will hear a few words from friends here. And we invite anybody who would like to share a thought to speak out loud. So Mati and Sorek, please. So um, what uh, what Cherry spoke about uh, got me thinking a lot about what does it mean to be proud um, proud in my Jewishness. Uh, Cherry sort of uh, made a her way was uh, from from uh, being in America and not observant into coming to Israel and being observant. To me, I think everybody has their own story, 
to me, I was born in Israel and I was born observant. Um, so, so what does it mean to be Jew to be proudly Jewish? What does it mean to be proud in my Jewishness? Um, I have a feeling that uh, somehow in outside of Israel, the challenge could be bigger just because there are other people around you that are not Jewish. Um, or maybe the challenge is, is smaller because there are other people who are not Jewish. So you have to express your Judaism more to understand who you are. But uh, just to me, I think for before anything else, it's this question. Am I proud to be Jewish? In other words, I sometimes I do what I'm supposed to do. Sometimes I don't do what I'm supposed to do in terms of my uh, Jewish obligations. Um, but am I proud? Am I, am I, it's not only being happy, uh, happy to be Jewish, but am I proud? Am I, do I have this feeling that my Jewishness is a source of pride to me? And if it is, then then how? And I think that's that's a piercing question. Rabbi Steinsaltz uh, used to speak about it a lot, about what the Rabbi Michal started uh, in the beginning of the evening, about what is my title? Is my is being Jewish my first title, my second title, my third title? When I uh, when I uh, introduce myself, I saying my name is Natan, I'm a father, or uh, my name is Natan, I'm an Israeli, or my name is Natan, I'm Jew, I'm a Jewish, I'm, I'm a Jew. And um, I know that I, I, I have this feeling that Hanukkah really invites, invites me to put more emphasis on, on uh, my, my Jewish pride, on saying it's not only that I'm Jewish because I was born Jewish, but I'm Jewish because I'm I this is this is an essential an essential part of who I am, and it's a it's a, it's something I'm working on, uh, and I I don't have a lot of uh, times where I have to express it, um, but I but I but I I believe that in a way the Hanukkah candles. Uh, the 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 glowing of the candles, uh, the fact that we have to share with everybody the miracle, right? We have to put the candles on the on the on the windowsill so everybody will see from the outside that uh, we lit the candles. That that's a very uh, uh, very big statement that I'm doing what I'm doing not only be, not only in my own house in the inside. Uh, but I'm doing it on the outside. I want pe other people to know. I want other people to know that there was a miracle, and I want other people to know that I'm uh, I'm expressing that miracle. That I'm a, I'm a receive I'm a receiver of that miracle. And if you if you look at that that way, then really the, the lighting of the Hanukkah can candles on the windowsill is. It could be, in a way, uh, something that we could do all year long within ourselves. Do, do we leave our Jewishness within? Do we leave our Jewishness inside our minds or inside our thoughts, inside our, our, our inner parts, saying, uh, yes, I'm Jewish, I, I, whatever that means to me. I'm not, I'm not talking now about observance at all, but... Uh, but whatever it is that I, that I feel Jewish, I feel I leave it inside. Um, or am I expressing it outside? And expressing it outside means that I have to stand behind something because once I'm expressing it, I'm saying something, right? When it stays inside, then it could be whatever it, it will be. I don't need to put words. I, know I don't need to put images. It's just me and uh, and myself. And once I put out an image, I put it out an act. I put out. Uh, I, I'm saying something. Then all of a sudden, I have to stand behind it, and then I have to see to check within myself: Do I stand behind what I'm doing? 
Do I stand behind my act or my words or my uh, or any other kind of expression that I'm making? So I think that's a very strong uh, a very strong challenge. Uh, and then again, the question from the other side is, is it real, right? We can express many things and there's nothing real in it because it's just on the outside. It's not in the inside. So having a strong feeling of pride in the inside, a uh, strong feeling of belonging in the inside, and then uh, sharing it, being able to share it with, with the courage to share it at the outside, I think that's something very, very uh, strong, a big message of Jewish pride from Hanukkah. And I think that in a way, that's also what we do in Shalhevet, right? We, we learn Torah a lot, or many of us have come, th come through Torah learning in different stages of their lives. And the courage to uh, stand in front of a learning partner and to say something, to have to stand behind what we're saying, uh, to see if we understand or not. And if we do understand, do we, did we understand like uh, our learning partner understood it? And what happens when we understood differently and we can argue a little bit, not from a point of, uh, of anger, but with the point of standing on our own, standing on what we understand, what, what we believe, what we, uh, what we uh, see in the text. I think that's another expression of Jewish pride, being able to uh, taking take the Torah and turn it to our own. So, uh, so the time to that, and uh, uh, a big man has joined us, Rabbi Amichaya Evan Israel, the son of Rabbi Steinsaltz. Thank you so much for joining. And he'll say a few more words about uh, Jewish pride. And uh, not before, uh, we'll hear another uh, nigun uh, right now uh, uh, from, from Solik and Mati. So the Chaim.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Rabbi Amichaye, thank you for joining. Um, so hi, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon to you. I hope I'm heard well. I'm uh, actually talking to you from the middle of the Arava Desert, uh, down south, uh, where I'm camping with my family. Uh, so I'm trying, I try to find a quiet spot uh, in here to speak to you all. And uh, it's a big honor to be here with you to participate in this special for Brain Game. Um, so we already lit the eighth candle of Hanukkah and that's already giving us the feeling of, and the sense of almost ending it. And, uh, you know, when, when since it's a, it's a relatively long holiday, eight days of candle lighting, so sometimes you have the feeling that, okay, it's the first night, it's the second night, I still have some days to go, I still have some time to think about it, to contemplate, and to be part of, of this Chag uh, internally, in the, way it's, uh, the way I'm supposed to be. Uh, but that's it. Then comes the eighth night, and uh, and then you have to ask yourself some questions. Are you really there? Did you really um, did, did you really take part in this special holiday? So, uh, and I hope you all do. And you still have and you still have some time till the eighth candle. So when we're celebrating Hanukkah and uh, standing next to the Hanukkiah watching the candles, watching the light, watching the fire. Um, so first thing that comes in mind is, of course, uh, Nespach Hashemin. Nespach Hashemin, the miracle of the pure cruise of oil um, that was found on the first day of Hanukkah on Chafhei Kislev. They found that Pach Shemen, that little jar, cruise of oil, and it was holy and pure, no one touched it. And, uh, and then the story goes on from that point. But I learned something this Shabbat, this past Shabbat, and I saw a very interesting and uh, if I may say moving um, Hasidic saying that actually, the cruise of oil was found much, much earlier, much earlier than the 25th of Kislev on that year. The cruise of oil that was found first was found first at the heart of the Maccabim. As the cruise of oil represents the part of us, the holy part of us, that is invincible, that is that part in our heart, that particle in our heart that is untouchable. No one can touch it. No one can impurify it. No one can do, no one can harm it. And each and every Jew has this spot, have this spark, this Jewish spark that is invincible and untouchable. No one can do anything um, to that um, Jewish spark and the Maccabim when raising and fighting against the many and not just many in numbers but you know such a, a big army sophisticated army in the matters of, of, of these days standing there standing out and saying okay as Nathan was mentioning earlier we're pride of our Yiddishkeit. We're proud of who we are, and we're going to fight for it. This is revealing that inner cruise of oil, that inner part that is saying no one can touch us, no one can break us, no one can harm our Jewishness. When revealing this spark, this holy spark within themselves, the Maccabees were actually becoming worthy 
of revealing that little cruise of oil hiding somewhere in, a, in the Beit HaMikdash. So since Hanukkah is a holiday of education, Hanukkah also reminds us the word, the Hebrew word, chinuch, education. And it's a, it's a holiday that we try and focus on education, on what we give to the next generations, what is our message to our children, what do they see from us, what, they, what can they learn from us, and what do we teach them. So I think that one important point that we need to teach our kids, and maybe the word teach is not a proper word here, because this is not something you teach. This is something that you show. This is something that you celebrate. And in that way, our kids will see it and will internalize it themselves. And this is by revealing our inner cruise of oil. Revealing this part, this spark, saying, I'm a Jew, I'm proud of it. This is the most important part of my identity. And when I go on the street, when I go to work, when I go, you know, when I'm, when I'm resting, in each and every part of my time, my schedule all over, you know, throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year, throughout my life, the most important part of me is my Jewish part, my Jewish essence. When we show that to our kids, when we show that to the people who we try to educate, we send them this message. There, our Jewishness is not just an important part of us, is not just a main part of us, but it's the part that is truly invincible. This is the part that is truly intouchable. When we acknowledge that and when our kids acknowledge that, that will give them the strength um, to, you know, to live through life in this complicated, modern, complicated world that we all live in. So I wish you a Chanukah Sameach and that we all be able to reveal this inner cruise of oil. Chanukah Sameach. Lechaim, Lechaim. Thank you. Lechaim. Lechaim. Jeff. Thank you. I, I just wanted to expand on a, a little note that I just sent to Sherry. Uh, I, I was looking for the books and I found she's written a Jewish book called Upside Down Boy, Upside Down Boy. And uh, I, I bought it uh, while we were talking. And I feel that's how many Americans like myself who had a similar uh, upbringing to Sherry's. I grew up in Silver Spring, a Reformed congregation. I knew very little about Judaism. Uh, and I've been um, trying to get myself right side up uh, from an upside down boy to hopefully a, a grown and, and properly standing man who I should add, um, the Shalevit program requires many people like myself to uh, make a jump, um, uh, to jump high because we're scared of sitting down with a knowledgeable Jew and uh, uh, it's easy to hide. And this program tells us stand up, stop being upside down, stand up and try and this is a wonderful program and i thank you so much for all you're doing and for sherry's son who's actively involved in this and for all of you and let's hope more of us uh, join uh, this unique opportunity thank you thank you jeff Chaim. Chaim. Chaim Zatan. thank you robert falk thank you sherry thank, thank you thank Chaim. you we're, we're actually on on the closing part so if anybody has uh, anything to, to share, anything to think about uh, our, uh, our title, This is the Time, and if not, we will close with, uh, with the last nigun. Does anybody want to say something? Yes, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, I've, I've um, kind of um, learned, I've developed that, that invincible part of myself that's me the jew the jew nancy um partly by being aware of african-american issues in america and that struggle and the movement and, and i think we can compare in a way the movement in the 1970s 
among black Americans was called Black is Beautiful. And, and I kind of see now as I'm growing older that, that we have a lot of, you know, we are also outsiders in America. Very welcome, but we're outsiders. And I guess what I'm trying to say is there, uh, you know, we are beautiful too. We Jews are beautiful. And I didn't really grow up with that kind of an ethos. I, I was proud and my family was proud, I think most of us to be Jewish, but I don't know, I'm kind of rambling here, but um, I've, I've kind of learned to be a proud Jew by seeing some of my African-American fellow patriots and friends be proud about their soul. And, and, and you know, there's, uh, anyway, I guess I'll keep it short, but uh, I think we can learn from other ethnic groups who have struggled and believe in themselves as having a lot to offer, being of course totally human, but also I think um, black folks have something special that's a little different and Jewish folks do too, as, as Rabbi Steinsaltz just shared with us, where there's that invincible soul and I'm, I'm trying to get more in touch with it. It's, and B, I would say if I was gonna give advice to anyone, be really patient with yourself. It's taking years and decades for me to kind of evolve. And, and uh, I encourage everybody to, to let that road unfold. It's not something that happens in a year or two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. L'chaim, l'chaim. l'chaim. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. Happy uh, winter. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other on other shall have it events and in the meantime have a successful and meaningful learning. Chanukah Sameach, Lechaim Lechaim. Lechaim. Chak Sameach. Chak Sameach. Thank you, Nata. Thank you, Robert Falk. Thank you, Sherry.